All right. Hello. Good evening for those of you in the, you know, eastern part of the U.S. or wherever the heck you're at, whatever time zone it is. Um, I'm doing a night stream, which I don't usually do. It's kind of fun. Uh, yeah. You know, so what am, what am I here to do tonight? Good question. Uh, I think I'm going to work on the Moog Model 15 MIDI controller tonight. Um, I got my parts early uh, in the mail, which was great. Uh, it didn't take as long as I didn't think I would get them till Sunday, but they came today, which is awesome. So uh, I popped uh, the remainder of the pieces into the boards. I'll show you in a second, but um, I probably should have streamed that as well, but I didn't. Uh, so I'm going to kind of pick it up and do some soldering tonight, hopefully get a lot of interconnects done and show you a little more about the project. Um, for those of you who may just pop on here, the, uh, Moog is a synthesizer company. Model 15 is a modular synthesizer that they made a while back. Uh, and they have an iPad, or the way I've been using it a lot is on the Mac uh, Book Pro M1, the new silicone chips from Apple. You can use uh, an iPad app on there, and I think they made it for it now. They also have a free VST and audio units plug-in for it, which is awesome. Uh, and that's free. You don't even have to pay. I think the app's like 15 or 20 bucks, something like that. Uh, but the... Uh, VSTs are, are free and the audio units so uh, you can use it as a plug on Logic or Ableton Live or whatever kind of doll you're working on which makes it super cool um, so yeah so uh, I'm going to be building that a little bit more tonight talking about the project uh, and that's, that's where we'll be um, before I got on here I was listening to music and uh, I was just going to kind of let it keep rolling. And then I, I started to have these nightmare visions of uh, that came to mind of all these streamers and YouTubers and everything who've been getting all these DCMA notices because they have some kind of audio on in the background. And man, I, I don't know. I don't know about you, but <laughs> Jesus. And so, so I went on YouTube just now and looked up a couple, you know, how to, what kind of music can you use on Twitch and, you know, like different platforms. How do you do, how do you use music now? I mean, it seems like a, just a totally insane conversation, but basically the, the video I was watching was like, just don't use copyrighted music at all. <laughs> just... I mean, come on, man. Are you, are you like kidding me? Is that really where we're at now? I mean, it's just like, it, it's like, what, is it, what, I guess, what is it going to be the point here? I mean, is it going to be like, you know, what if I'm, what if I'm live streaming, uh, I have a mobile live stream rig and, uh, I'm in the car and I turn on the radio and a Beatles song comes on. <laughs> just, you know, what the hell? Does it mean they're going to take me down because it's like I turned on the radio? I mean, I, I don't know. It just seems so ridiculous. It seems like, you know, or like what if you're on the street walking and you're live streaming and somebody's playing radio out of a car or something and it just comes through the stream and then you're going to get taken off because... And then they were even talking about like they're not enforcing it yet, but... It's only been banning clips of videos right now that have that content, but they're saying they actually have the ability to, Im you know, bombard your stream in real time as you're streaming and like give you a DCMA notice or like take your stream off air or something. <laughs> I mean, oh my God. It just seems like the utility of it, it the ins I guess it's just the insanity of this. I don't. It seems I is it is it just me? Maybe it's because I'm just not used to it now. I don't know. But 
it's like what's the use of making music it's like you're an artist and you make music and if you don't listen to it in this super narrowly defined way it is just completely like you can't use it at all <laughs> i mean it's just it's like it just seems like like if i was streaming tonight and i had some weird little band that no one heard of on there I mean, they, that would, like, popularize it, right? I mean, not my stream, obviously, because no one's watching right now. <laughs> but I'm saying, you know, people just, you know, if you listen to music, it's cool. You listen. Oh, like, I've been on streams of probably like, who is that? Who are you playing in the background? Somebody will tell me, and I'll look, I'll look them up and be like, oh, wow, this stuff's great, you know, and go seek them out. You're just, like, you're cutting all that out. So what's... It's kind of like, what's the purpose of making music if it's just, I don't know. I mean, I understand. I understand. I understand that you have to take some modicum of, you know, protection. So because people that make that music have to make money and blah, blah, blah. More like the record companies need to make money, yada, yada. I get it. But at the same time, it just it just seems like it gets so ridiculously... Uh, over defined and out of control meaning just so controlled that this the the grip is so tight that sooner or later nobody can breathe and then there's just nothing like tonight so it leads me tonight so i wanted to put music on and then i started watching what were what were his suggestions in the video his suggestions were in the video is to go to of course there were a few free sites that have some background music and things that i'm sure you know i haven't I haven't listened to any of them, but I'm sure I would hate all of them. <laughs> you know, like, it's just, it's going to be some nerfy electronica music or, like, just some terrible shit that I don't really want to listen to, right? And then, and then the other option is go to another paid service site where you can pay to have access to the, to the non-copyrighted paid copy non-music. It's ridiculous, man. It's like, so now I got to go. It's like, say, say you buy music on like some kind of iTunes or a Apple Music Store or Spotify or whatever, but then you can't really listen to any of that anywhere or use it because I, because now I want to make my own video and, and just talk to people. So while I'm broadcasting, now I can't use any of that. So then I got to go to a different site and pay a different amount of money. So then I can use the music that is free to use through streams that I don't even like, but, but but then I can hear something. It's just, I don't know, man. It's crazy. It's going to be like, you know, wh where does it end? Does it mean like, you know, I can, I can only listen to the music soon in this room that I'm in right now. But if I go to the room next door, I think you have to pay a use fee for that. <laughs> because then you're, you're in a different location and there could, you know, uh, somebody else could be in that room. My friends can be in that room, so no, I you know we don't want them hearing that music without a without a payment system involved. So maybe we can just localize it to all of our iPhones and smartphones, so you know proximity. And if you're within ten feet of that person and they hear the music, it just automatically charges their credit card um, to to be to have the privilege to be in my space to hear the music coming out of a speaker in that's in my room. I mean, come on, man. It's crazy. It's a crazy world. Oh, jeez. Okay. Enough of my music rant. We're going to go on to uh, some really silent, like silent movie uh, streaming here where you can watch me um, solder and talk about buttons. <laughs> All right. Anyway, uh, you know, I, I'm... I'm always mixed. I'm like, do I do I live stream this stuff of me just sitting here like cutting up wires and soldering buttons together and things? I don't know. I mean, maybe somebody finds it useful out there. Um, I guess it's you know, I you know maybe it is useful in some way. You know, I've I've definitely watched other streamers who are makers who do the same thing. They're just sitting there and like I've watched keyboard streamers where they're building keyboards and. Um, yeah, it's kind of fun just to hang out sometimes and, you know, see what people are up to and see what they're making. Um, so yeah, 
So I, that's where I'm going to be at for a little while tonight, at any rate. And uh, before I start, though, uh, because it's easier while I'm here, I thought what I would do is I have the Mac hooked up again tonight. Um, I thought what I would do is switch over there and show you kind of uh, some pictures uh, from the first Moog uh, controller that I built and the internals like I showed you last time kind of what it looks like on the outside I'll show you again uh, when I switch over to the other workstation but I thought it'd be fun to look at some of the pictures of the inside because that's what I'm kind of using now to make it a lot easier is a visual reference guide um, and I think that's what I've been pretty meticulous with uh, denoting it on the new one as well I just it makes it so much easier when you write basically what I'm doing is uh, I have a, a spreadsheet that has a map that shows every single button and switch and connection or whatever and where, what to what multiplexer goes to, to what, um, I guess, port or channel on the multiplexer. There's 15 or, um, what is it, 15 or 16, 16 ports on each multiplexer. Uh, so it, it labels that like M1 is multiplexer one and then, you know, Z, zero is the first port, second port, third up to 15, you know. So I have all those written down kind of on the inside boards. So it's just really easy. You just look at it and go, oh, this is M110 and then you know which one to plug it into when the time comes. Um, I think it makes it a lot easier. And, uh, and, and off, also, you know, me referencing these pictures here, I'll show you now. Uh, let's go over, switch over to the MacBook Pro screen. Here we go. Um, I don't have, oh yeah, I do have the ATEM on here. I'll turn, I'll turn me on for a bit. Um, okay, so what are we looking at? Uh, this is uh, a uh, map of the Model 15 uh, controller. Uh, so I'm using an Arduino Pro Micro here, and I just took a, a screen grab of a pinout I found on the internet. Um, I hope I don't get a legal notice because I used a piece, an image that was found on the internet somewhere. I'm sure that will happen soon too. It does already. At any rate, uh, I'm using them, uh, you know, Arduino uh, Pro Micro. Uh, I ordered a ton of these off AliExpress. Uh, get them super cheap, like two bucks or something. Uh, and they work really well. Uh, and this one's super small, and, and, it, and it's kind of pushing this thing. The firmware, I have almost no memory left at the end on this thing, but uh, I haven't optimized that memory uh, either. I've been, I worked on the, the uh, keyboard controller projects, the music keyboards, and I ended up having running out of space on the last project I made that had six... Um, expression pedals, 14 control knobs, and then all the keys, uh, 48 keys. And I, I ran into, because I was loading up lots of uh, scales, I have custom scales on there that will just switch the keyboard, map them to different uh, scales. And it was eating up tons of memory. So I did tons and tons of optimization and learned a, a bunch of crazy kind of C programming language optimization type stuff to really save on every byte. And at some point, if I'm motivated, I'll actually uh, optimize uh, the firmware for the this mode controller. And it will probably shrink it down quite a bit. It might help with some things. So sooner or later, I'll probably do that. Um, for now, it's not. It's pushing the limits, but uh, the Pro Micro works great. I think I use every single port on it pretty much. Um, but it's just it was just enough to pull it out and get done what I needed to do. Uh, yeah, so so what we're looking at is the map. Uh, and I made this 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 stuff at the top is just kind of things that uh, seem like they are occupied by other things uh, in, in the it's really confusing when you're sending MIDI data. Uh, I'm still confused uh, by what, is taken by what kind of number mappings uh, like this says poly legato note number and it, it says it's using midi cc 84 and things like that and, and sending values in that range so i'm not sure I don't, I don't know i don't know all of them and i don't 
Uh, I'm always worried that I'm going to be conflicting with some kind of MIDI standard MIDI space and you're going to be sending, you know, MIDI data over, you know, some CC number and interfering with Legato or something like changing some kind of crazy control that you don't want to, like you're going to be doubling them up or something. Um, so I've tested this uh, on all my devices and it's, it's worked fine. Uh, it does work on the iPad. Uh, and the Max and you know M1, all that stuff. I, I haven't had any issues. Uh, so uh, what I did also is I'm using a uh, 100 uh, milliamp. Uh, I, I edited the Arduino core in some place. I always forget where this at. It's really hard to find this information too when you need to start doing weird stuff, like uh, because it. By standard, I can't remember what it's set at, but it's definitely not 100 milliamps, maybe 500 or 1,000 milliamps, something. I can't remember exactly. Um, but uh, it's meant that it can consume more power, and when you would plug it into an iPad, it would give you an, you know, a, a kind of an overload error or something and say, you know, th this device isn't supported, it, it needs too much power. I don't know if that's the same on kind of modern iPads. This was a year or two ago, a couple years ago. So it may not be as much of an issue, but what I did is edited the core so it would only uh, report 100 milliamps. Now, I don't know if that actually restricts the Arduino to only consuming 100 milliamps or if that's just kind of a reporting thing. Uh, all that stuff gets gray to me, and I, I did this a while ago. I can't remember. Um, so if that's ever an issue, that could be edited as well. Um, another thing that I do on this thing, which I've been doing with my MIDI devices, is also changing the boards.txt file. And I can't remember, it's also confusing, but if you go down in that boards.txt file, uh, you can find a place to name the device. And I give them custom names, like I, I name this Moog Model 15. So if like you open up the, in Apple, you'd go to like the sound, uh, can't remember what it's called, like audio settings, sound preferences, and then you go to the MIDI studio. It's how it shows up on the computer, like what it what device is connected. Instead of it just being a random number or saying USB port modem or something like that, it will you can give them custom names. Um, you do have to change and give them a kind of custom uh, ID number too. Uh, and if you were going to make this commercial. Uh, those are some kind of naming space again too that might conflict with other devices out in the world. So uh, there would have to be a formal something research and process to figure all that out. But for your own DIYs, I just give it kind of a random number in there and, and you just got to make sure that they're all individual or that will conflict with the ones that you have. Um, but then I give it an individual kind of ID and name and then I can have all the USB devices on my uh, that I create named differently. Those have been two kind of tricky but handy things. Okay, back to this kind of spreadsheet. So I'm using the Pro Micro and then these this is a picture of the multiplexers that I'm using. Uh, they're like I said, they're 16 port multiplexers. And and what this thing is is basically a master map of like every port on every device and, and how they're connected. It's the connection map. So uh, you can see uh, I have this panel one and what I'm calling panel ones are like these, um, uh, how many did, did I break them up into fours? Yeah, so, so there's four panels, four front panels that I made for this uh, that are kind of goes in rows. Uh, and these are all the kind of devices on each each panel. Like this one has, what is it, 10 potentiometers. Uh, what is this? Oh, and, and these are breaking it up into the device uh, on the modular. So like Moog has a filter bank in there that has 10 knobs. So then I, I name those. And then they have an attenuators bank on that first panel. Uh, and that has three potentiometers. But basically, these are just listing all the parts. Uh, there's like a three-position rotary switch. Those were what I was waiting for in the mail. Uh, and there's like a rocker switch. And uh, I think that's it for those, and mostly just potentiometers on that board. But what is it giving? So 
these numbers in this column here, uh, so those are the parts that are actually connected to that panel. These are the MIDI CC channels that it's sending data on. So I, I, I made these up, I assigned these. Uh, they could be changed in the firmware if you found a conflict or you needed to. Um, that's something that could be done, but these are MIDI CC channels that I assign uh, to send that data so it would uh, talk to the app. And then uh, this, this, this column basically just shows the range that it expresses values in, 1 to 127, and I think that's all of them. Uh, and, and then now this column is uh, the multiplexer that that device is hooked up to. So again, uh, on a Pro Micro, I don't know, I think you have maybe four analog ports and maybe, I don't know, 10 or 12 or something digital ports, something like that, I, maybe less than that, I don't know. But the point is, is uh, and some of those, if it, like we're using uh, for the multiplexers, we're using um, I squared C, I think, uh, which takes I think three ports plus the data pin that it can communicates on. So that's a fourth. Uh, you know, so you're eating up your digital pins already. Uh, so to incorporate, I think there's like, you know, 40 or 50 potentiometers on this thing, a ton of rocker switches, all these rotary switches that have, you know, th three or four positions that all need ports. Um, to accommodate all that, that's what the multiplexers are for down here. Basically, we use six of them, uh, you know, times 15 ports. So it opens up our, our ports quite a bit. Uh, and so what this column does is says what MUX it is. MUX is multiplexer, MUX number one, and then there's some MUX two. So, uh, so we're defining which multiplexer we're connected to. And I can't remember exactly, but I think we did break these up into digital multiplexers and analog multiplexers. I, th I can't, can't remember for sure, but I don't think you can mix the two maybe. Not sure if that's true because some of them, I think those multiplexers that are analog are connected to one of the four analog ports. And then the digital ones are obviously connected to digital ports. I think that's the way that's rolling uh, and it works. Um, so multiplexers, this tells you what multiplexer that device is hooked up to. And then in turn, uh, this, this next column shows you what port number on the multiplexer. So again, there's 16 ports on the multiplexer. It tells you which number to plug it into on that multiplexer. And then what's the next column, importantly, uh, shows you uh, what port on the actual Pro Micro uh, the multiplexer is so hooked up to. So this gives the map of how to now chain all those multiplexers back to the Arduino Pro Micro and plug all those in. Um, so basically, it's the complete map of everything on this device, how it's, it, it's cross-connected. Uh, it also gives totals. It looks like there's 96 different switches, knobs, potentiometers, whatever. There's 96 things hooked up to this thing. And it looks like there's 48 analog, 48 digital, I think. And yeah, I think it's evenly split, 48 and 48. Three digital muxes and three analogs. Uh, now, uh, this is just giving kind of totals. So it looks like there's 48 potentiometers, 10 rocker switches, um, one three position switch, uh, one six position switch, uh, two three position toggle switches, and two two position toggle switches, and five buttons. Um, so tons of stuff. Now, this was tricky info to find too, this stuff here. So the multiplexers use direct port manipulation. Uh, this, this is confusing to me. Uh, I always get confused every time I read about this stuff, uh, trying to learn Arduino stuff, it gets really confusing. At any rate, it, it, it is a way faster way because it would also be extremely slow uh, to you know, use the, all the regular port ways to access data, it would, it would kill it. It's the process is not fast enough. So it uses direct port manipulation, but figuring out, uh, usually that people list ones for the Uno, what port numbers you can directly, you know, use direct port manipulation, what, what ports you need to do that. Okay. And for the Uno, it's two, three, four, five. 
But for the micro, it's completely different. And these are our data lines uh, for uh, this mul these multiplexers it's to make this data line uh, ports much faster. The micro was tricky for me to figure out. I had to dig around on the internet everywhere, but it's f it, it is 15, 16, 14, and 8. That was tough info to find. And then uh, for the mega, it's 24, 26, 27, 28. Now, I haven't tested that one. Can I test to the micro because I've used it and it's working? Um, I actually haven't tested the Uno either, but uh, the Mega, I haven't tested either. So those, you know, your mileage may vary kind of thing, but you never know. All right, so uh, that's kind of the map of all the, all the devices. Uh, and here I'll show you quick. These are the photos that I've been referencing. Pop those up if I can uh, find them here. Uh, boom. Um, so, yeah, I'm gonna try to make this a bit bigger. So this is the uh, the uh, photos that uh, that I took when I built the first one inside. So this is the top unit of the first one. Uh, those are all the devices in there, all the uh, you know pots and everything. Um, all those numbers are the, uh, what do I want to say, the MIDI CC channels I'm using. And then below, I'm writing what MUX, MUX 2, uh, ports 0 and 2, 0 through 2 that this one uses. Um, and then on the pots, it's hard to see in here, but uh, if you look a little closer, uh, oh, I can't do it. I'm on the wrong keyboard. If you look a little closer, uh, like this. This says MUX 1, 10, I think, MUX 1, 11. I, I noted each one, and I did that on the new one as well, uh, e even a little bit more meticulously. And that's telling you what MUX port number are down here. This is the MUX. Uh, the yellow ones are the uh, I2C data lines. The white one is the pin, uh, the, the main data pin that goes to the uh, either digital or analog port on the Arduino. And then there's a black, I'm using black for negative, red for positive, five volts. And then the blue are data lines coming into the muxes. So blues are data coming into the mux, yellows are I2C, and the white one's the data pin uh, that the IT, or that the um, mux needs. And then black and red are negative and positive, respectively. Yeah, and that's it. So. Uh, and, and here I can scroll through a couple more of these photos. This is the next panel down. This is the most complicated one by far. Uh, it's kind of a spaghetti wire soup there. Now, this is a super messy, prototypey way to do this. Yes. Uh, what I was working on, I haven't done it yet. Uh, I'm not sure I want to invest that much time in this project, but it would be great to design front panels instead of using the kind of laser cut birch wood. It would be to you know make PCB front panels that are just graphics, you know, no no actual electronics, and then make a second PCB inside that basically it ha you know interfaces all this stuff, and then you know go surface mount for some of this stuff, or you know for the pods and stuff, not really surface mount, but just have it so it it ties into a you know proper circuit board that just has traces for all this stuff. So then. You just have kind of like da ribbon data connectors that travel from one thing to maybe to connect the muxes. But then at that point, you might as well just integrate the muxes, do some either through hole or surface mount stuff and just get everything on one board and then just have kind of data bands that connect box to box or something, you know. Um, that, I would love to do that. It'd be super cool. But that's, that's getting a little bit involved. And I don't know uh, the circuit design programs that well. So I've been reluctant to kind of jump into that and just spend a ton of time on that. Um, here's the third module. It has two muxes. So this one has three muxes in it. The top one has one. But some of these cross over, like this one at the top here, you can see some traveling down through. I have those cutouts at the bottom. Uh, there are things that travel down and connect to different muxes because maybe there wasn't an analog one in the top one and it needed it. So I travel it down to one that might have an analog mux or something. So that's what gets tricky is some of the muxes you have to, you know, uh, data lines travel between boxes to connect to the right mux. Gets a little bit confusing. Um, yeah. 
So, and then you can see in the bottom of the box, they're just bolted together. I have some holes uh, pre-laser cut in there and just put some, uh, I think there's M3 or M4 screws or bolts, you know, just kind of bolt each layer together. Um, it's funny, the bottom box uh, has nothing here. I was waiting with just a, a nice river rock I had because it gets wobbly because it's so tall. Uh, but I think I ended up, I, I, I found two big pieces of brick and I think I like hot glued bricks into the bottom of this thing to keep it uh, stable. Um, I would like to find like a steel bar or something a little nicer and drill out holes in it and then just bolt it to the bottom at some point. But I, I haven't done that. I don't know what I'll do with the new one. I'm imagining I'll go back to the, the brick routine just for these kind of prototypey ones. The only reason I'm building this is because I basically have all the parts just laying around. And I thought it'd be good that I can document this more. I'm thinking about making a, you know, a kind of YouTube guide to this, not just streams, but uh, maybe put together some nice YouTube videos and, and then just kind of open source all the firmware and all the, you know, laser cut files, all that kind of stuff. And my bill of materials, um, most of the stuff can be bought on Amazon pretty easily. I think I did buy some of it. The last stuff I just bought was Amazon. Um, but anyway, I think I might do that too. It'd be kind of nice. I'd love to see some other people out there build uh, these these controllers. It'd be fun. So, uh, yeah. So And then you can see in this last picture, it's the Pro Micro. I, I 3D kind of designed and 3D printed a little... Uh, I don't know, holder for it uh, to keep it in there. And then uh, these, I, I had to bring it up a little bit. Uh, so I had, you know, 3D printed a f some risers to get it in the right spot. Uh, those bolted on the bottom, you can't see them, but there are little rubber feet on there too. Um, so, yeah. So there we go. So that's kind of where we're at. And what I'm going to do now is switch over to the work desk and we're going to, you know, start soldering or jumping into some of this stuff. Um, yeah, so I'm going to do that now as well. I'm going to leave this here. I'm going to open up this other mic and take my mouse with me so I can control this stuff. Oh boy, I keep forgetting. I got to gotta switch back to the PC control here. Um, hold on a second. Get off there. Come back to the PC. All right. And we are just going to switch views now. Leave this guy here. All right, so we're at the work desk. Uh, can, oh wait, I'm on the wrong view though still. Here, boy. I'm doing this across the room, so uh, it will probably take me a few tries. Oh, there. Okay, so we made it. Um, so what I was gonna do is just, I'll quickly show you, like this is the first panel. So again, these are kind of laser cut birch wood. Uh, that's, that's the top panel. And I started, the knobs that I had on hand, I kind of put on there already. And uh, some of the switches, rocker switches are in there. Uh, and then potentiometers. I did just get today uh, this one that was missing. It's a three uh, position switch. So one, two, and three. So it's like a selector switch. Uh, so it's great uh, that we got some of those. I was worried about finding those. Sometimes those are tricky to find, but I actually found on Amazon the, the exact ones I needed pretty quickly. They are extremely overpriced. I mean, God, if I was... A, if I ordered these in AliExpress, I could probably get 10 to 20 of them for the same price that I paid for like two. I mean, it's, it's kind of disgusting, but I mean, those are, that's the luxury of it being closer, right? So yeah, anyway, uh, so that's the first board uh, and here's kind of the backside. Um, you can see, I'll get a little closer here. You can see the numbers where I'm the M1 or something is the MUX and then the port number of the MUX that I'm writing directly on. Sometimes it's below if it's not a pot. Uh, and then above is the uh, MIDI CC channel that it will actually transmit data on. 
Uh, I don't really need those on this board, but I, I've been putting all that info on there uh, just because it keeps it straight for me, just so I know what's going on. And I think what I'm going to do tomorrow is photograph these after I'm done soldering some, the connections. So if I do a guide, uh, it's kind of documented uh, and it makes it easier for other people because I'm finding it so much easier. Because the first time I did this, uh, I had to just constantly have that uh, spreadsheet in front of me and just like cross-referencing uh, what port, what you know, like back and forth. And it gets mind-numbing trying to keep all the lines straight and all that stuff. So uh, I spent, you know, the first day just kind of labeling all this and it makes it go so much faster. And so this is like the front, here's the back panel, uh, and then these are like sides, and then there's two bottom, a bottom and top uh, board as well. Now, uh, you know, the, the sizing and all this stuff is kind of arbitrary. I did create the Adobe Illustrator file that has like all the front, front graphics that I've etched, you know, the stuff in here. Uh, but I cut, so it's kind of to scale, but then I just made it a scale that fit on an 18 by, what was it? It's not 18 by 24, it was that, the shorter one, eight, or yeah, 12 by 18, not 12 by 24. So kind of fit on there well. So uh, if you had a small laser cutter, uh, these would work well. I mean, you could now take these and the, the Illustrator files I have and convert them some way and make a PCB front panel, which would be super cool. Uh, like black with, you know, white lettering or something. That'd be, I'd love to see that. Anyway, here's the, the kind of second panel. Uh, I just got all the parts in today, so I, I populated them before I streamed here. And this is the back. Now, this is the one that has, you can see these kind of uh, brownish ones. These are six position switches. Uh, these are kind of the most complicated switches on, on here. And those are these kind of selectors for, you know, those like octave ranges and stuff like that. Um, yeah. But uh, I guess I'll just show you all the panels. So, and then this is the third one, uh, the back side and front. Yeah. And uh, let's see, where's the fourth one? Here's the, the fourth one, the kind of bottom one. This is the front side. And this is the back side. Now, I've pretty much uh, exposed, uh, I think, all of the controls for the, the Moog. There are a few weird things that I haven't exposed. Like, uh, there's a ribbon controller. I mean, I guess I could probably uh, create something like that. And, and there's a couple, like, other, like, weird kind of internally hidden kind of uh, MIDI type st stuff that you could send like the ribbon and I can't remember else maybe some of the key stuff or or like the arpeggiator I'm not sure if all those have MIDI CC controls as well they may uh, but I do not have any kind of uh, switches or anything for that stuff uh, that could be a fun kind of uh, side project maybe is to, to either integrate it into this one or maybe make a separate controller i think we could do that and that would have like all the asundry stuff that's missing from this one i don't know that'd be kind of interesting um this is the back plate uh for that last one and what's cool about this one is this one has the usb kind of jack hole uh on it uh and now this one is the bottom plate these are the rubber feet i have on here and then uh, this is that Pro Micro uh, that I bolted into there and kind of countersink the bottom. Yeah. All right. So uh, that's that's where it stands now. So what am I going to do now on on here? I think what we're going to do is I'm going to just uh, look over these and uh, I think. Either maybe I'll do some soldering or maybe I'll just put uh, some knobs on for tonight and then uh, we'll see where it's at. Uh, because all of these need tons of knobs on the front. And then, uh, you know, I, I have our multiplexers here too. Uh, here's our multiplexers. Uh, lighting's not so great in here, but uh, they all need headers put on them. 
Now that's a question. How so the way I'm cross connecting these now is I'm soldering the wires directly to the components like the pots and all that stuff. But then I'm taking I'm using solid uh wire as well, I'm not using stranded. And then uh I've been just taking that solid wire core, it's about the right diameter, and just plugging it into a female pin header. And that's, I've used that on a ton of projects and it's working well. Is it the most robust though? No. Like if you, you know, try to transport this thing and it shook around in a car for four hours, I'd be scared, you know, it might, <laughs> it might shake a few of these out. Um, that said, I haven't had any problems so far. Uh, but if, you know, I have been debating back and forth, you know, do I take the time to take all those data lines out and maybe solder those to a male header pin? So you have like a 16 long male header pin and then you solder all the data lines to them so you could like really physically like kind of plug it in and it would be really stiff and firm. I, in theory, I love that idea. Uh, the thought of soldering them all on is not so attractive when I can just wire strip the end and jam it in there. So, I don't know. For this, it's a prototype. I probably won't. I don't know. We'll see. We'll see. See how motivated I am in the end. All right. So, uh, okay. Here we go. So, let's look at these. So, what am I going to do? Am I going to solder or am I going to do these other things? I think tonight I am going to just put on the caps because what I have to look at uh, for these multi-position switches, I'm actually not sure where um, the direction of the uh, data pins and everything. Um, I know how they connect, but uh, I'm not sure uh, like these six position switches, let me get this thing. Assuming, I don't know where they start and end. One, two, three, four, five, six. Because these are, okay, switches. So these switches, I don't know if you can see them really closely here. So that's a six position switch. But what you'll notice is are there are 12 on the outside and two on the inside. Uh, and what this is is two pole six throw switches all the switch stuff gets super confusing too but the the poles are basically the ones on the insides and what that means is they're separated so this switch when i turn it is actually controlling two different outputs at the same time the two different poles and each pole has six pins that connect it so those are the throws. So it's, you know, a six position switch, but it has two separate kind of outputs of six, right? So I'm not sure, I, I know I only need one of them. So I know I have to just solder onto one pole, but I gotta figure out which are the correct outer six pins because the way it's spaced on here, it's like, it doesn't line up. So I don't really know which one's the pole. I mean, I might have to sit here and like, you know, use a, uh, you know, a um, voltmeter or throw it through just a test circuit or something like that to figure out what's what. But that, that won't be that big of a problem, but it's still something I got to figure out. So, uh, that said, I just don't, I don't think I feel like doing that tonight. So I think what I'm going to do is I could now, uh, there are some other things to, uh, solder kind of positives and negatives to um, I could do that um, that's possible on some of these other boards but there's not many there's just some uh, basically some negatives to, to attach and the rest are data because they're all switches that were missing so I think I might wait on that it's possible I could do the muxes too for a little soldering, but for right now, I'm gonna just do these uh, 
these caps and then maybe end for tonight. I don't know. We'll see. I probably because I'm gonna work on this tomorrow for sure. Um, probably in the daytime. So tomorrow morning, you know, sometime I'm gonna get up and uh, start uh, working on this again. And and I'm the goal is tomorrow. I think to kind of have this maybe finished or or if it not finished, you know, close. So maybe. If, Finish it off Saturday. I don't know. We'll see. See how far I get. Um, man, I really need these visors these days to see everything. Okay, so what I'm going to do now, the way I do this is I set all the pots all the way to zero, and then I put the caps on. I'm actually using the wrong kind of caps for these. I mean, the the knobs. Uh, the they're not the they're knurled knobs on the potentiometers. But I could only find these, uh, you know, ones that are made for smooth shafts quickly and easily and cheaply enough. So uh, I'm just using those and kind of screwing them onto the neural things. They get a little crooked sometimes or whatever, but um, I don't really care. Still works good enough. Okay, so that one went really well. Now, I have noticed that these knobs uh, with my scale here they don't completely line up perfectly but it doesn't really matter as long as it's like close when you're playing I'm not like really looking at this stuff that much anyway I'm really just listening to the sound so I found that that none of that really matters that much it's more just you know having knobs to begin with which is why I built this project now, because of the neurals, sometimes when you get this, it's hard to get it to actually keep wanting to go to one of the ridges beside it. So I keep having to uh, undo and redo some of these to get it to kind of work right. That one's on there. Now, I'm curious to see what happens with this project. The first one that I did... I did have some phantom stuff going on, uh, meaning when after I was done building the circuit, there would be uh, just certain potentiometers that would kind of be like stuck. They wouldn't work. They would freak out and you could see them just sitting there jittering, uh, meaning the, the value on the, the, the screen uh, was just kind of like the, the knob would look like it's doing this on the, on the Mac or the app or whatever, right? But but if you would change the knob on the device, they just wouldn't move. It would just sit there and jitter. So I, I wasn't sure what was going on. If you would mess with the wires and stuff in back, bend them and things, sometimes it would work for a second and then go away. And So I was assuming they were damaged potential arms. They're either faulty, just straight up, because these are cheap, you know, uh, AliExpress buys of like 100 potentiometers or whatever. It could be that. Or, or I was worried if it was wiring. Um, I did some research before I did that. We'll talk about that a bit. Uh, on, you know, because I, I have seen in other projects where they like separate the analog from the digital ground planes and stuff like that on, on circuit boards. Uh, but from the stuff that I was reading online, that's not really supposed to matter here. Uh, and it has to do with how it connects to the Arduino and whether the Arduino is actually separated. And I can I can never seem to find really accurate information on this. And I've never really, you just, you get exhausted at some point, don't want to keep researching it. But uh, it, that stuff's a little unclear to me, whether it has an impact or not. The, it, at any rate, the, the research I did the other night was basically saying it shouldn't matter at all as long as your ground's connected to ground and positive is positive, it should work. Uh, I did have that happen on a knob on the other mode controller just the other day, and I was thinking, oh boy, it's that same issue. Maybe it's the potentiometer's busted or it's my, the way I wired it or something. But then what happened is I ended up switching it either the cable, the USB cable, or to a different powered USB hub, which I think was more robust in its power output. 
and it completely stopped doing it. So now I'm wondering if it's not just the physical devices or the wiring, but it could be that I've been power starving these or using cheap cables that aren't uh, transferring the power properly. So that's another thing to kind of be aware of uh, that, that I've been doing. All right, here we go. So I'm gonna continue with these knobs, get these on here. That one looks good. I love this. Uh, this this filter is like a, it has ten. You know, has a low pass and a high pass, and then like kind of eight different frequency bands. And uh, when I used the Model Fifteen, I always reach for those, but. Most of the presets they have on there that they've pre-programmed, hardly any of them use this thing. And I'm always so bummed, like, but then I'm also kind of lazy to run over and want to, like, patch it up, you know? Uh, but I suppose that's what this is all about. That That is one of the bummers of this, obviously, the limitation, uh, is that all the routing cables, which are accessible in the iPad app and all that stuff, uh, obviously are not. Uh, on on this device um, I was actually trying to scheme up a way to do that I still would love to see if not me somebody else do that it'd be super wild is uh, come up with like a dummy system so you could use dummy patch cables and it just had like a switch or something in there so it, when you plug in the patch cable it just depresses the switch and then sends some kind of MIDI CC command to indicate uh, the the connection points but that's something that I, I'm not sure that they've exposed on the uh, model 15 app I don't think there is any kind of uh, what, what did I say MIDI CC kind of remote access control to those I think it's all either you know touch and drag or click and drag I think those are the only ways you can actually access those those patch points um, but it would be awesome if they made it uh, a MIDI CC control for that so you could just kind of send an on or an off kind of signal and it would indicate that there's a patch cable attached to it. Um, I'm sure that would get tricky because then it indicates that the patch cable is connected somewhere else and you know all that. Uh, but uh, that'd be that'd be super cool. I would love to see uh, that that done. Because then you could have like the real deal. You could have basically a Model 15 full controller uh, that's just all MIDI. I mean, and honestly, for what a fraction of the price, like this, the real Moog Model 15s. I, I was looking at it, I, fifteen twenty thousand dollars, probably more now, twenty five thousand dollars, something like that. I mean, that is uh, crazy expensive for those things. I really want to know when those were made. I got to look that up. Uh, I, you know, I've been kind of put so much time into this project and doing this stuff, and I actually have no idea when those things were produced. Like, I'm guessing it had to be no earlier than late '70s to uh, mid '80s, sometime maybe is my guess. Can't have been '90s, I don't think. Uh, I mentioned it on the last stream, but I've been reading that book about Moog. That's been fun, too. Uh, well, I think it's... Is it Wendy Carlisle? Uh, is the Switched On Bach? Uh, it's, it's kind of fascinating reading that story. And her transformation uh, kind of from a man to a woman. And how, you know, how... Uh, you know, in today's standards, that's very kind of, you know, nothing... But at that time, it was very, uh, you know, I remember she was very terrified uh, to uh, kind of uh, announce that to the world and, and the kind of fallout that that would have. Um, that was That's kind of an interesting dynamic to the whole Moog story is reading how all that went down. Um, 
Another one I've been re not reading. I was just as I was, uh, uh, you know, I don't know how I found it online, but the guy uh, I can't remember is R Ronaldo. What's his last name? The the founder of Make Noise Music. Uh, he worked at Moog. Uh, he moved there and basically got a job at Moog and worked there for a number of years. And then before he started Make Noise, which is also in uh, North Carolina, I think. And uh, it's interesting to hear him talk about that kind of connection too. And, you know, starting out there and then how he kind of started his company and, you know, moved into the modular world that, you know, of, of making modules. Got this one. Boy, these neurals make it tough. If this was like a proper, you know. It'll make it a lot easier. Oh well. Good enough. I mean these knobs and stuff get out of control. I even I think I paid ten bucks for like twenty of these on Amazon. And that's a pretty good deal. I mean you go to the specialty sites like I get emails from a couple of specialty kind of synth part sites and stuff. They charge like 75 cents to a dollar or something for these things. My God, that gets so expensive so quickly. This is another thing like if I went on AliExpress and, you know, just dug this up. You could, I've done it before. You, you can get hundreds of these things for a fraction of that price. I mean, I don't know. Because it's business. Got to make your money. Okay, uh, oh, I'm not done. I got ahead of myself. Uh, what are these? This is, so there's a couple specialty knobs. Oh no, I didn't put one on the, the high pass. There's one more of these guys. And then we have one specialty knob on this board. All right, got that guy in place. Okay, so our one specialty knob is gonna be this gray one. I wasn't really excited about that, but it's all I had, and I didn't want to buy more of these either. Um, let's get this guy set in place, roughly. Oh, that's not right. Uh, oh, much better. It's almost, that's like perfect. All right, so we got them all in place. Uh, the first controller, I had all black ones, but I used them all up. So I have white and gray ones left, and I just uh, replaced that one with a gray one. Still looks cool. Uh, but that's our three position switch. I think these on the original model 15 were like the witch hat kind of or the long kind of looks like a claw or something. Can't remember what they call those, but uh, it was some other kind of, uh, uh, you know, knob they had on there. But these seem to work just as well. These switches feel better than the last ones I had. They're still kind of very tough and clicky, but they definitely work well. All right, so, uh, and there is the kind of complete front board with all its knobs on it. It's looking good. Um, so uh, this one's kind of complete in terms of this. Um, on the back side, what's left, um, obviously we have to solder all the blue uh, wires to all the data pins for each device. And then uh, this one in the middle, I think there's a, just a ground, and then, and then this will be... Uh, three blue data lines, uh, but I think I'm going to leave that till tomorrow. Um, so I'm going to move on here to this next board. Oh boy, this is the complicated one. I guess the most dense board. I'm going to put a bunch of uh, the knobs on here. I'm going to fill this guy up. So again, I, I usually turn all my potentiometers as far to the left side as possible. 
uh, and get everything kind of set that way. So that's my zero point. And then I add all the other knobs on there. Now this one has those uh, specialty switches as well. Uh, and it has four of them. I'm going to just go ahead and put those on now. Um, because I don't get confused and put the other things on. Perfect, beautiful. So this is that oop, six position switch and it looks great. And then you can kind of, you know, dial it in wherever you want. Yeah. So, and I think the white's gonna look okay. See how it goes. All right, next. What's our next one? Let's get this guy on there too. Uh, where, why can't I find it? Oh, it's right below it. All right. Yeah, works great. They, they line up pretty darn well. I was surprised by that for some reason. Okay, this one's on as well. Looks good. Last specialty knob. All right, there we go. Those are all on there too. Now let's get all these other knobs on here. Now I have noticed that uh, with these knobs, I have to kind of have them up a bit. Uh, if I push them all the way down, I was having them kind of bottom out on the uh, on the board or what have you. Oh boy, that one. That one goes way past. What what's what gives? Holy moly. Try that. Okay, good enough. Uh, let's do this one. All right. There we go. Next one. Yeah, it's kind of a messy alignment. It lines with the the low number really well, but sometimes you got to find a fudge factor that's in between of it. Yeah, much better. That's like perfect. It's a little off the bottom and a little off the top, but it it it's much more, you know, evenly distributed. All right. There we go. Another one down. Okay, let's get this guy on here. Oh boy, this is another one of those weird ones. It like reads 10 to 90, uh, but if you line it up with 10, it's way out of range. 
I didn't realize that. I don't remember that from the first ones, but must be how it is. All right. Okay, that one's good too. And I gotta crack open the second batch of these. I don't think we use all of these now in the second batch, but most of them. Okay, that one's good. So I wonder how many people would actually build one of these. I mean, it's not, it's not like expensive, but it's also not cheap, you know, like, I don't know. Some of this is kind of subsidized for me when I was teaching that, you know, I got some of the materials, but you know, I don't know how much would this cost? Uh, you know, I could, that'd be actually fun. I should put together a, a spreadsheet on, on cost for all the materials. I know just like the few bits that I ordered off of Amazon here, that cost me like 60 bucks. Uh, but that was just for some of these knob caps, some, you know, you know, the six and three position switches and stuff like that. Uh, now, if you ordered all the potentiometers and stuff, like I ordered these from China in bulk. But again, I imagine if you ordered all of these, uh, you know, domestically at like a dollar a piece right you know that's going to get really expensive it's, you know I, I i don't know but maybe you know it's what 50 60 bucks something like that i don't know something so it's not out of control either but uh i'm guessing i'm guessing this thing you could probably build for how much 200 300 i don't even know Gonna, it's actually going to be really interesting to, uh, I'd like to do it, is to put together now a, uh, you know, not just a bill of materials of what, what you need, but actually some pricing. And, and price this thing out and see how much it kind of costs to build one of these. Now, the kind of the, there are some kind of a little bit more intangible things like, like the laser cutting, uh, you know. If you don't have access to a laser cutter, which I don't anymore, uh, that would be, it would be quite expensive. If I had to go to like the local hacker space and pay a monthly fee to get access and, you know, and I think it was like this a few years ago, it was like $25 an hour to use it. Jesus, that, you know, that gets pricey. It probably would be a hundred dollars to, you know, cut all these boards. Uh, so that could get pricey. So if you didn't have access to your own laser cutter or something, uh, that would definitely be an additional cost. Uh, I think that's another reason to think about going PCB panel for some of these. I mean, which also would be expensive though, probably. I, that's something else I wanted to price out is go on to some uh, PCB board manufacturers and because these are quite large, how, how much would it cost to you know, do kind of, you know, silkscreen PCBs for all these front plates. Uh, I imagine that would be uh, a bit on the expensive side. But, I, but I've, I don't know. I mean, because, you know, it's jail PCB and all these kind of cheaper, uh, you know, Chinese site ones uh, probably would do it a lot cheaper. I don't know. So there, there's our finished kind of uh, front board for this most, complex part. I actually like the white on there, I think. The white looks kind of looks kind of snaz. Not too bad. Um, I'm still not sure about the gray. Uh, I'm, I'm actually thinking maybe no gray. I'm actually thinking I have a few other colors like blue. I was looking at blue on there. That might look cool. I was trying to keep the colors like, you know, I like the white. You know, I was trying to keep the colors you know, deadened a little bit, but maybe, you know, maybe if I just went like a one pop of like blue or, I mean, we have red and I guess only, 
We have some red switches and red buttons, uh, and we have one green button. Maybe you could make it green, or maybe you could make it, could match it red to go that route. I think red might look better than just the gray. I have red. I don't even know if I have red. I have pink. I do have a red. So I have a red, I have a green, and I have a blue. Let's look. Maybe I could, uh, maybe I could pick one of those instead. Not sure. Let's see here. So, um, what do we got? Which one was it? It's this one. So here's our board. This is the gray on here. Here's our red knob. I don't know. It's kind of, it's hard to see me holding it. Red. Kind of liking the red. It's like a nice hot. The green. Not so into the green. I mean, the blue looks cool, but I'm actually thinking red. I mean, we have red buttons, so maybe a red, red knob. But it kind of draws so much attention to it. I mean, it's like, all it is is the frequency range knob. <laughs> it makes it like, you know, frequency range knob. Push me. I don't know, but maybe it would look kind of cool because it just kind of matches the whole... I think I'm going to try it. Because it matches the whole kind of uh, red and black. You know, we have the white ones. I think the red goes better with the white, actually. We'll see. I'm going to try it. Well, you know it's changing. This is all cosmetic. A little crooked. I'm going to see if I can get it to straighten up a bit. Now nah, it's just kind of where it wants to go. Which is just fine. Okay. So there's the red knob. I I'm thinking the red looks way better than the gray. I don't know. We're going to try it. I mean, I can always switch it out later. Uh, but I'm kind of digging the red. I think it's cool. All right, let's move on. I'm going to move on. And oh, wow, this one's done. I already did this one. Uh, I guess I think I just had to pop in this, this black switch that was missing. I haven't done the, the negative uh, power wire yet, but we could do that another time. Let's look at this guy. Oh, this guy's, I think, done too. All I had to do is I popped in the three black switches over here and uh, these buttons over here. So uh, what needs to be done with those are uh, uh, some wiring, but that's that. So, wow. Okay. So that actually kind of went quickly all of a sudden because I already did some of the other, other ones. Uh, that's great. So uh, what do I need to do then? All the all the knobs are on, so our knobs are done. I'm gonna put away these knobs for now. That's the wrong. I get confused of what bin goes where. Okay. Uh, now what? Am I gonna solder muxes? What am I gonna do? I think I think I'm gonna leave it here tonight. That's what I'm gonna do. Because uh, I'd rather start with the soldering and stuff where it were in the morning where there's a lot of light and I can kind of see everything. Uh, that'd be better uh, than the artificial lights. Yeah. So that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to leave it here and we're going to start in the morning and uh, start uh, soldering everything up and uh, putting all the, I guess once, okay, so what I'm going to do is all these backboards. I'm going to wire as much as I can on here 
uh, meaning basically all the positive and negatives. Uh, I don't think I'm going to do the blue wires yet, uh, the data pins. Um, and that's because I don't really know how long they need to be. So I think what I'm going to do after this, because we've finished placing all the pieces, and once we get all the positive and negative in there, uh, that would be the first order. Then what we're going to do is actually build uh, the enclosures. So I'm going to press, these are all press fit uh, connectors. So we're going to, I'm going to use a little rubber mallet and put those together. Maybe we'll do that tomorrow. We'll, we'll build that uh, and get the, these enclosures working. It's a little harder to work because you got to reach in. But then what I'm going to do is solder on each of the blue wires to each data pin and then kind of stretch them down and then uh, put the header pins on the muxes, get those in there and hot glue them in. And then uh, what I'm going to do is then start measuring out the blue lines and doing them one by one and just connecting them to the muxes. And that will basically wire it up. So it'll go all the devices will plug into that mux. Uh, but before I do that, I think once we have all of this built, before I can just start pounding on the data pins, what I'm going to do are uh, the, the connectors like um, the four data lines for uh, the data bus plus each one of the pin lines that run to each mux. I'll do those all first. And then also the positive and negative I think I, I connected them last time where all the muxes came. I run the positive negatives to the muxes from the Arduino. And then from the muxes, I think I connected to two of the pins on the board here, which I think I'll, I'll do as well. So uh, the power will come from the Arduino to the mux and then the mux to the, to the board. Uh, yeah, I think that's probably what I'm going to do. And then once all the data line, the four data lines are done and that communication pin and the positive and negative and connecting those to the board. So once all that stuff's done, uh, then I'll start doing the data lines. And what I'm thinking I'm going to do is do just glue all the muxes in place and run all those data lines to could because you have to run the data lines to every mux. And some of them are daisy chains. So mux one connects to two to three to four and those will all go down. Uh, so I think I'm going to run all of those main bus lines first and then just run all the data pins for each kind of section at the end. That, that's the flow, I think. So there you go. I'm going to switch back over here. All right. So I'm back over here now uh, at the the main computer. Uh, I gotta switch my camera view, don't I? There we go. Okay. Uh, so I'm not sure. Uh, I'm looking at my my things here, and it looks like there's one intrepid viewer. Whoever you are, uh, you've had the glory of watching knobs be placed all night long and watching me rant about uh, DC whatever the DCMA copywriting on music. Congratulations. So, uh, yeah. Anyway, uh, I'm going to leave it here. Have a great night, and I will see you in the morning sometime to uh, resume a bunch of uh, soldering stuff. All right? So uh, take care, and see you next time. So long.